once you've taken over these businesses in these small towns, you are locked in for your career, however many decades that lasts. I want to know his motivations in getting into the business. I would like to know the conversations he had with my grandpa, how he felt when he realized this trend in our family. I want to know what it was like for him when he first began working earnestly in the business. If it was hard for him to get over these more difficult parts of it that I feared growing up. If there was times where he, he doubted what he was doing. If he could do it all over again, would he do the same thing? I'm almost positive he'll say yes, but these are real questions I have for him, of course, because he had the same experience I had. He grew up in the same dynamics that I grew up in. Who else would be able to relate more to how I'm feeling than him? I was so surprised when this teacher said that Brent's going in funeral service. I thought, oh. He really probably would have wanted to be a hockey player. <laughs> it's funny because that's what dad says that he would have wanted to do if he wasn't a funeral director, but lack of skill got in the way. My family's owned a funeral home in our small Canadian town of St. Thomas for over 90 years. It may seem strange to grow up around death, but for us it was a part of everyday life. Sorry, I had to go to the car to get some. It's okay. I'm the first son in four generations not to become a funeral director. My decision has weighed heavily on me. I worry about what it means for the future of my family's funeral home. Are you staying for the service today? No, oh, okay. Not. We had the register book just down to the right there. Okay. And, hello, Hi. how you doing? I'm doing good, how are you? Good? How good. Are you? good to see you. If you'd like to sign the register book and then if you'd like to go in and visit with the family. This is our son, this is Blake. Hello. Oh, uh, and so next generation going into the same business? Uh, no, he's a producer with a news oh, network. Oh, right, So that's right. why the Oh, yes, that's what they're talking Yeah, yeah. Yes. So anyway. different business. But. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he's, he's, he's much too smart for this profession. <laughs> good to meet you. My grandfather was the brother of Paul Peterson. Oh, okay. Oh, 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 okay, sure, yeah. We had the register book uh, yeah. just on the right. She mentioned it was the Walls farm. Yes. That was yes. one of the yeah. Walls descendants, who I've served their family yeah. Yeah. also. You're welcome. My aunt asked if anyone could sing it, and no one was able to, and I thought, someone's got to, and why not someone in the family? And she really meant a lot to me. I know that she would love it. Today we've come to say so long to mom, grandma. Great grandma, as God has called her to her new home. So now we're here to praise dear mom for all she meant to everyone. We Hi, buddy. Say hi to the big hug. Oh, hi. That's a that's a funeral. Hey, I'm just at the funeral. That's why I'm in a suit. Right. How was the funeral? Uh, it was very Sorry. nice. No, it was very nice, and everything went really well. All right, I'm gonna go get changed really okay. quickly because this okay. is ludicrous that I'm in a suit. <laughs> When I was in high school, I would help with visitation, so holding the door, helping kind of show people where to go. And then, other than that, around the business, like helping with the lawns and washing the cars and putting on the suit, being in the funeral home. It was kind of maybe a little glimpse of what it might have been like if I had, if, if I had done that job. I wouldn't say I was five years old and looked at the business and said, I'm not doing this. It was that I fell in love with different things. I was always very interested in history. It was the idea of the power of witnessing moments while history is made. 
This was my childhood bedroom. This is where I would be asleep in the middle of the night when my dad would get a phone call. You'd hear footsteps, you'd see the light underneath the door. He would walk from his bedroom over here through this hallway to the bathroom to get ready, get dressed. We were very aware that he was going to put a suit on, that he was going to go outside into the cold, and that he was going to go pick up a, a dead body. I have this very striking memories of our funeral home phone. My aunt Jennifer grew up around the funeral home and also moved away from St. Thomas. We called it the bat phone. You what called you, it the bat phone? Yeah, what'd okay. you call it? We called it the funeral home phone, but I think that's, <laughs> but, but, but you're right, that's it what it is. It was black. And it had all these like intercom buttons, and we called it the bat phone. And you have, I did, and I and whenever called, whatever hour of the day, whatever you're doing, you, you have to up. answer that phone. That's perfect, actually. <laughs> we weren't maybe we weren't that creative. That phone ringing, it still sparks a little moment of anxiety. Everybody, stop it! Everybody, be quiet. When I'm home, briefly, however briefly, and that phone rings, I shut up as fast as I ever did. It's 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 a strange thing. I'd be interested to know how he prepared himself to do this work, because I don't think he was naturally built for it, just like I don't feel like I was naturally built for it. I'm going to talk to Colin Haskett, a young funeral director in a neighboring community. He's around my age, and in a way, I feel like he provides a glimpse of what my life might have been like if I had decided to become a funeral director. This is my great-great-grandfather, Charles Haskett, and uh, then his son, which is William Haskett, and then William had two boys, Eric and Clarence, and then my father, Bill. So there are six funeral directors in five generations. Thankfully, we're all passionate about it, and I think that's where family businesses get into trouble is when people feel obligated. Uh, if you love what you're doing, it's easy to, to keep a clear direction, and, and we're all on the same path. So this was my great-grandfather's. Our family used to transport the deceased by horse and buggy. I'm kind of glad to say that I don't wear hats like that and I don't transport people by horse and buggy anymore. When I was four years old, I made the decision that I was going to be a funeral director. And uh, at that time, it was because my dad had two separate riding lawnmowers that he used to cut, the, to cut the grass at the funeral home. And I thought, what a cool thing to be able to drive two different lawnmowers. I was four as well when I kind of realized for the first time that there was this trend in our funeral home. It was my great-grandfather started the funeral home in 1926, um, and then my grandfather and my father, and every generation there was one boy born, and every generation they did it. And I was four years old when I'm like, wait a second, great-grandpa, grandpa, dad, do I have to do this? And from the moment I first asked that question, um, my dad's always said, you don't have to do this. You can Whatever makes you happy, you can do. If you want to be a funeral director, that's fantastic, but if you want to take a different path, that's... That's fine too. Um, so may, I don't know. Maybe if he had had uh, riding lawnmowers, I would have. Uh, I would have been. Uh, would have been a better selling point. What do you think the stereotype of a funeral director is? Black suit and dark tie and white shirt and and um, you know maybe not very personable and certainly not very comforting and you know just sort of this this creepy this creepy image of someone that deals with the dead every day, and uh, that's uh, that's certainly not how I would describe myself at all. I'm I'm far more suited to dealing with the living than I am the dead, and uh, it's just the ability to do both which makes me good at my job. I'm just the guy that lives down the street that, that doesn't know how to build decks but I do know what to do when your mom dies. Okay, that'd be great. And uh, if there's anything that uh, comes down, I will let you know and you have my telephone. Thank you very much. Bye. Did you have a direct line from the funeral home to your home growing up? You are standing in my bedroom. This is where I grew up. Really? So, yeah. We were very much had a direct line. I believe very strongly that my number one goal and my number one job is to stay in business. We're increasing our reception facilities and we're having different types of receptions and we're selling alcohol. And that's not necessarily because that's exactly what I want to do. I just want to make sure that we remain profitable so that we can continue to do what it is that we love. Let's see if I can pull something out here. You've got all kinds of different options, and uh, now you can get rings, you can get tie pins, you can get cufflinks. This is actually DNA uh, keepsake, mm. so lots of different options. I have done some neat things with uh, cremated remains. We have put people in their tackle boxes, in their recipe boxes. Um, actually, we have someone here that was just placed in their cowboy boot as an urn. I had a gentleman, the strangest one yet, uh, every night before he went to bed, he had a bowl of ice cream with his granddaughter. So he is in a nice cream tub. People are tired of what we would refer to a cookie cutter funeral.
A lot of us in southwestern Ontario are smaller operations, family businesses. We have some larger corporations coming after the independent funeral homes. On our own, none of us would survive in this business or certainly in the cremation world. What we decided is if we could do it collectively, then we could all do a good job, and that's exactly what we've done with the crematorium. Cremation is becoming increasingly popular, but loved ones are rarely present. I have never witnessed a cremation myself. I grew up around the funeral home. I've been to the funeral home constantly my whole life. I've seen more bodies than I can remember in the setting of in the in the main room of the funeral home with made up in suits with with flowers and framed photographs. But maybe it's the volume, maybe it's being here and within the last few minutes just seeing so many bodies coming in from 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 the region. I think that I could have done it. The men who tend to this long process tell me the last muscle to burn is the human heart. Occasionally, I would bring stress home from work. It didn't happen very often, did it? But it did happen, and I'm the first to admit that it did happen. And I can't believe there's not a funeral director out there that it hasn't, they haven't brought it home. And, and so, but there was a quote in, and, and, and uh, Blake said in the article, my sister used to yell back at him if he would explode because maybe we were too loud when he just got off the phone or, and, and I would just take it. And, but his quote was, um, we knew we were not the uh, source of his anger and it anger, didn't take much to know what was. And it didn't take much to know what was. He knew I had brought it home from the funeral home, right? Mm -hmm. Growing up, I saw firsthand the toll funeral service took on my father. Many of his days were spent helping other people through the worst days of their lives. We saw the side of it that wasn't always great, and he dealt with it very well. Yeah. But there were times that it was stressful. And if you asked me at those moments, you know, you want to be a funeral director, I'd say, hell no. Yeah. <laughs> there are circumstances that happen here that I feel like walking out the back door when the family are walking in the front door. The thing that's going to make me retire is families not agreeing. I mean, absolutely not talking to each other and probably after the service is over, like never talking to each other again. So you're on your way to the hospital? Okay. I, yeah, yeah. Um, what I'll do is uh, I'll... Uh, I think since you're on your way there, and there won't be a release tonight, I don't think, from the hospital. So I'll the phone can ring anytime. It can ring at 9.15 at night. It can ring at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's a release for your dad because you expressed what he had, had wanted to. So, yeah. Well, again, my condolences to you. And I'll, I'll call them in the morning. You know, people call because they're in need. So, When I think about the connection of Brent and the funeral home, I think about the fact that he had this cool parking lot well, where everyone would play hockey, would play hockey and they, they stored the nets in the garage. All right. <laughs> These will do. 
Old wooden sticks, they don't make them like this anymore. Are those gloves a little big for you, maybe? Are they like, they're like arm gloves or something? Oh, yeah. How you doing? Aww. You walked from the house? All right, ready to play some hockey? Yeah. Okay. Over to win. Back to G-Pa. Oh! And then... <laughs> oh <laughs> I've been playing hockey since I was probably seven, eight years old. I played travel hockey for many, many years. My dad missed very, very few games of mine. He taught me how to play goal right between their house and the funeral home. <laughs> I wear it as a tribute to my dad, but I was also born in 1958. This was my playground. This was, this was where, you know, I, I grew up. You know, I learned to play tennis. I assumed that my parents always knew that I wanted to be a funeral director, but we really never sat down. I mean, I, they heard about it from my high school counselor that, oh, I guess Brent's going off to Humber to take funeral service. I never, I just assumed that they knew. But quite frankly, I thought I was gonna be a professional hockey player or a professional tennis player. But I think lack of talent sort of got in the way. Yeah. We gotta go in the funeral home, right? And play hockey. And who, who's in there, do you know? Leo. So here you go. Do you know what my grandfather's name was? Yeah. Leonard. Oh. And you know what Leo, Leo is short for Leonard. Good job. This is called a beer. That's called a beer. You're right. A casket beer. A casket beer. <laughs> Nope. And there's and there's and when when and there's no ghosts here. No ghosts here. There's no ghosts here. And I remember as a kid just being so so afraid by that idea of like, um, aren't you afraid of being around the dead people? Aren't you afraid of the bodies? I guess I'd seen like yeah. you know, zombie movies or, or or monster movies or something. And I remember him just being again. It was yeah. just like a light bulb was just like, well, no, no. because they're dead like you should be more afraid of the mailman for example than you should be of the dead body in the in in another room because living people can hurt you dead people cannot hurt you this is not a monster movie this is real life on my own phone here oh your own phone oh that that's i can't help but wonder if perhaps one day win will develop a passion for this profession where i didn't My dad, since I was, you know, 11 or 12 years old, he would send me on errands. That would include sometimes going to doctor's offices to sit and wait in their office until uh, a certificate was signed. Actually, this was, uh, there was, that was a doctor's office at one time. There was uh, doctors and coroners there. Train companies came through here. Uh, movie stars came through here when they were on the trains and there's a platform on the other side. There's another funeral director. This is, Miss, this, is, this is Mr. Alan Hewson. Alan's dad actually apprenticed for my grandfather back, yes. <laughs> back years ago. Your father was the best man at my father's wedding. I think I did know that. Yes. I'm glad we ran uh, into you. Welcome to yeah. Canadian winter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's funny to say, but I think there was more of an expectation that the son would take it over. Yeah. I never felt pressured, mm. but did I feel a sense of obligation? I would, I would say, yeah. Having the family business, a business that provides such an impactful service to the community, was kind of a badge of honor. Like, people knew our business, right? Like, you could own a printing shop. People not, might not know your business, but Sifton, Sifton Funeral Home, you know, took care of my grandmother's funeral. That's... It's like a bond to people for, their, for life mm -hmm. kind of thing. I was proud to be a Sifton. I know Grandpa, he really felt that it was a calling. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's the way I've always looked upon it with me. I... I, I I know this was something I was meant to do. Well, we I can't, can't say enough about yeah. your dad and how much it just was a relief to come in and know that we were a mess and he was so gentle and it was just like talking to a friend. Don't yeah. worry about that, I've got that looked after. Don't <laughs> worry about it, I've got that yeah. looked after. I don't know how many times I had people say to me, your dad helped me through a really tough time. Behind the doctor's back, they couldn't see. Your dad and grandpa walked in and my dad, the 
sense of humor joker that he was, said, oh yes, here comes the two undertakers to take me home. Wow. <laughs> he was really my first hero, and I guess I wanted to be like him, and I tried not to let him down. Here we are in 1926, the year we were founded. My great-grandfather founded our funeral home after serving in the First World War. He served with his cousin who was killed in action and awarded the Victoria Cross for valor. My family believes that my great-grandfather's experience of witnessing mass death and seeing his cousin buried in a mass grave instilled in him a desire to provide dignity for others in death. When the time comes, I definitely want this funeral home to be family-owned. And I want it to continue with the same values that it was founded on and that my father carried on and that I've carried on. How important to you is the name? Is the idea that, that Sifton will remain a name in this community? Um... Well, I, I, it, 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 it's very important. I also care about what our name stands for, and that's one of the reasons I still struggle with my decision. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, I thought we'd come in oh, this way. Oh, that's okay. Hi, how are you? Good. You are, are you ready for a Wheel of Fortune? Yeah, it's your favorite show. Here are the stars of our show, as St. Jack and Battle White. Here's the puzzle, and here we go. Please, I'm going to get you $5,000. Oh, it's opportunity. Opportunity. Good. Opportunity is knocking. Yes, sir. There you go. Combined effort on that one. I was wrong. There's no E. Bob's at the door. Hmm. Do you know what Grandpa thought about me not becoming a funeral director or me not deciding to be a funeral director? I don't think it bothered him at all. I think he realized that uh, everybody should make their own decisions. And I think that um, I don't think it bothered Lyle. I never heard him say. He was always so, well, he's got two books on you. He's very proud of all of his grandchildren. Basically, he followed my burgeoning journalist career. You enjoy being a journalist? I don't doubt my decisions. I still felt like there was some kind of family responsibility that maybe I'm I not. think Grandpa and, and your dad would say, no, you must, you must do the, what you'd like to do yourself and that you'll be happy in. I come from a farm background. I, I think those farms will all be gone. And I'd say it won't be long. I don't feel badly. I think that that's progress. In other words, we all we all make our own decisions. I love you, Blake. I love you too. <laughs> you shouldn't feel guilty, and that, that makes me feel sad to think that there's even an ounce of guilt. What do you do when you're at a funeral? You tell stories. That's the thing you're continuing. I don't know if you can think about it that way. Yeah. And mm -hmm. frankly, I, I think, who knows what's going to happen, right? I mean, everything's changed so fast. Maybe it'll be one of those industries that stays very much the same, mm. because we all want that close emotional connection, or mm -hmm. maybe funerals of the future will be very different. <laughs> That's <a moment>. That <laughs> was pretty good. That, yeah. is, that, that is not good. <laughs> <laughs> The smallest sprout shows there is really no death. All goes onward and outward. Nothing collapses. We're committing poetry. It's a reading of Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. Thomas Lynch is both a writer and a funeral director. He is considered the poet laureate of the funeral business. I say read, write, resist, and this is what we do. I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. Oh. <laughs> oh. My dad always said Thomas Lynch's best-selling book about funeral service, The Undertaking, is the book he wished he could write. Like my father, Thomas Lynch took over his father's funeral home in a small town in Michigan. He recently passed it on to his son. Uh, good morning, how are you? I'm not a bad roller man, how are you doing? <laughs> Very good, thank you. Do you want coffee? Oh, that'd be lovely, yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> what are you barking at, Bill? 
Oh, hi, Bill. Strange people coming? Hi, Bill. His grave has been dug since a year ago, November. He just refuses to go into it. I've declared it hospice care for the last couple of years, so I feed him Telegio and pricey cheeses, and now I think he thinks I'll go in the grave and he'll stay. That won't happen. Your attempted coup will not work, Bill. <laughs> but his grave's out there filling with snow right now, and uh, someday I hope he, he occupies it. Lay down, Bill. Just lay down. It'll be okay. Funeral service is nothing except uh, intimate access to a lot of stories. So I've always been interested in characters and the stories that surround them, the narratives. Being a funeral director in a small town gives you access that is not often shared by other people. Funeral traditions as they exist now in North America um, kind of take for granted that this is the way things are done, but it, it wasn't. Could you discuss maybe before the spread of funeral homes how death used to be treated? Up until the, maybe the last 50 years, probably even nearer term, the only problem created by a death in the family, apart from the ones you could catalog as, you know, you know, grief and mourning and religious vexations, the real problem was the corpse on the floor. What are we going to do about this? You can't live with a dead guy. Something has to be done. Somebody has to get a shovel or build a fire or drag the corpse up to where the birds will come and get, pick the bones clean. And it's around those activities, whatever it was, became by virtue of our, you know, curiosities, holy. It was looking into the open ground or the pond or the fire where we would form the essential human questions, which are, is that all there is? Can this happen to me? Why is he cold? Are we all alone? What comes next? We process death by processing the dead. We move the dead from this station to that station in this, uh, you know, this little uh, community theater that goes on. But the movement is important. You know, you can't stay here because we can't live with a corpse. Acting as a pallbearer and carrying the body of a loved one, in most cases, is the only act that remains. It seems like in North America we've become quite distanced from death. Well, and even that, we are entirely estranged from corpses, um, which to me has always seemed like the essential brief of a funeral is tend to the corpse. People will say, well, it's really for the living. Yes, but it's by tending to the dead that the living get better. A good funeral is one that by getting the dead where they need to go, the living get where they need to be. In the way that we sort of replicate the movement of someone from the edge of this frontier to the edge of the one we can't know, that's what a funeral does. It makes that, we go with them as far as we can go, and then we say, uh, with the brutality of the living, you stay, I go. Thanks be to God. Or whomever's in charge here. Thank you so much. Thank you that. very much. We haven't had a Sunday like this, Bill, in the longest time. Caring for one's own dead is common in much of the world, but rare in the West. In British Columbia, there is a small but growing home funeral movement that is reconnecting people to the process of tending to the dead. Hello. Mike? Yes. Welcome. This is Robert Smith Jones. He has been our dead person multiple times, including for our YouTube videos. Uh, one of those videos has actually now had over 700,000 hits. So She knew me before I was famous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, down you go. Okay, so the first thing we're going to be doing is carrying. Okay, everyone. We need at least three people on each side. And My name is Pashta Merriman. I'm a death midwife. If you were I am the executive director of CINDIA, which is an acronym for the Canadian Integrative Network for Death Education and Alternatives, which strongly supports families having meaningful choices, whatever those are, around death. I'm also a Wiccan priestess and, and actually ordained as one. Close off, yes. And Wicca has a much stronger focus on the balance between light and dark. And there is that respect for the cycle of the year and that death has to happen in order for there to be new growth. What we're going to work on right now is uh, washing 
the top part of him. There's something that happens between the mind and the body when you're hands-on with the body. That is what we used to call in the 70s a gestalt. It's like a whole bunch of things come together much deeper than just sitting by the body or praying or singing or writing a memorial or something like that. But it's also easier to process through to this is now a corpse and our beloved is still with us in our hearts and maybe in spirit, but this is just a corpse now. Okay, so let's then proceed on to washing the body itself. Most people feel that doing this is their last act of love and it allows the person who's been doing the major caretaking to have that one last time, but it also allows people who haven't been involved in the caregiving to actually participate in that and sort of feel like they gave a little bit. If I could have someone's help, Blake, could you help me here? Okay, you can let him down now. <laughs> It gets realer every time I do it. <laughs> <laughs> this is my favorite color, and this one is being kept for when it's time for me to sleep in the forever land, or whatever happens to you after death. I know one mother whose 18-year-old son died in an accident right in front of their house, a motorcycle accident. Doing the body care was allowing her to step one step over the threshold with her son, and that was ecstatic. Well, I mean, yes, she would mourn him not being there anymore, but that actual process of caring for him was one that was ecstatic, right? It isn't just an hour ceremony. It's several days that you can go in in the middle of the night and cry your eyes out with them or be angry at them for all the things that never got resolved, you know? All of those moments become incredibly sacred. I think that we've become increasingly detached from death. I think people don't grieve properly when they try to avoid seeing death. And so I think anything that brings us closer to our dead and to confront our own mortality is positive and healthy. Yeah, this is stunning. It's, uh, it's completely quiet and still, and pristine and beautiful. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it might not be a traditional cemetery with headstones and rows and flowers and everything, but I don't think anybody would object to spending the rest of eternity here. I think I have a very traditional view of funerals and of cemeteries just because the way things are done where I grew up. But yeah, I don't understand why this is such a rare phenomenon. This isn't controversial. This isn't alternative or fringe. It's just, just beautiful and, and peaceful. And that's what most people want when they're choosing a cemetery. I think my father would be really moved by this scene, and most funeral directors, to be honest. People, hello. hello. Hi. Hi. My name's Deborah Magdi. My family and I did a home funeral for our mother. So this was her bedroom the night that she passed. We were all around her and this is where she stayed for five days. So she has an ice pack on her abdomen, and she has an ice pack under her head, and an ice pack under like where her, the core organs are. It was just like a painting with so many beautiful colors and everything versus just your regular funeral, it was like dead body, funeral home, service, ground. Come on, <laughs> We had so much oomph and oomph and play with it. and we carried her out the door, and we carried her like this. And as we're carrying her, the ladies are singing in the kitchen. And we just carried her down the stairs and around the corner, and then there's a driveway underneath, and that's where Nayo's Ford Flex was waiting for her and it was raining 
and I said, oh, she's having her BC baptism. It's beautiful. We put her in and off we went. From what I've read and what I've talked about with people is that your body is just your vehicle, right? It's just what you're here with. It was her shell that we were disposing of, which we had to, right? And, and then her spirit was around with us. Nio Davis is a funeral director who helped Deborah with her mother's home funeral. Her experience working at a corporate-owned funeral home led her to embrace alternative practices alongside traditional ones. When you first get into funeral service, you come in with all these ideals and thoughts about what you're going to do and how it's going to go. And the more experience I had within that corporate environment, it just seemed like those ideals weren't able to be realized. We were told that we needed to have unlicensed salespeople with us when we were meeting with people who were just telling us that, you know, someone close to them has just died. What was their backgrounds? Would they come from sales of other industries? There were people who came from car sales for sure, photocopiers, um, just whatever their background was. If we were in the selection room looking at urns and caskets, um, I felt that their, their suggestions were biased, you know, based on <laughs> what kind of commission they would get out of that. When people have suffered a loss, how fair is it to put an employee in a situation where if they don't upsell, they can't eat? There should be no commission sales at end of life. Welcome to our uh, snow capital today. Tom Crean is a funeral director and a leading opponent of corporate ownership of funeral homes. When you serve people who are bereaved, you're serving people who are, to me, uniquely vulnerable. So when a organization of the size of Wall Street comes into that very delicate situation, there is an opportunity for people who are more ethically uh, challenged um, to make enormous amounts of money. In the city of Vancouver and Burnaby, there are nine real funeral homes left, and the largest chain owns eight of them. Do you think there's an awareness in the public that so many of the funeral homes are corporate owned and what the difference is between? No. We had a law passed where it was required for all of the publicly owned funeral companies to put their real name in all their contracts, all their signage and all their advertising. The 2009 Yellow Pages had their name in about a font of, I think, 0.5. <laughs> the next year, but it was there. So this is that process uh, called stealth ownership, right? Where, yes, where, that's where what a we corporation call it, stealth will, ownership. Where a corporation will buy a family funeral home and then keep that family name so the public thinks that they're still working with an independent family funeral home when in reality it's just a part of a, of a much larger corporation. Exactly right, yeah. The mass takeover of independent funeral homes by corporations is what worries me the most when I think about the future of my family's business. You know, it's such a critical time. It's so important that that environment is a caring and supportive environment. A funeral home's a scary place, but that's where I was born. My dad said, son, you'll fit in, boy, what a load of corn. I got the undertaker. In funeral service, you have a choice. You can develop a keen sense of humor or become an alcoholic. It can't be understated uh -uh, that I've been underrated in what I've undertaken to do with my time. So he called back a few minutes later and he says, uh, Jackie, your mother's body isn't at the morgue. My sister said, what? What do you mean it's not at the morgue? And he says, well, it's not here. It sounds like possibly SCI has the body. John Danilowicz and Jim Halliburton's stories share a common thread. They say their mother's bodies were both mishandled by funeral homes owned by Service Corporation International, a funeral conglomerate based in Texas that has come to dominate the funeral industry in North America. We had planned to have an intimate family service. We had planned to do a celebration of life later, but we never had anything. We never had anything. She said, I literally don't know how to tell you this, but mom has been cremated. She was on her way to the funeral home. Sorry. With our mother's um, clothing, 
Our mom had always taken very good care of herself. She always wanted to look great. She was a little bit of a fashionista and, you know, even, even in a walker, she would want to make sure she had high heels on. So the fact that our mother was taken and cremated in the pajamas that she died in and without her teeth um, is the part that gets me every time. We never knew anything about SCI or any other of their, of their um, brands. We thought it was Pleasant Valley, uh, a, a community, local uh, Vernon funeral home that's been there for I don't know how many years, but I remember seeing it as a kid. There's basically three entities in the town, and uh, the public doesn't know that they own all three of them. So, so, that, so families are going from one to another to another, getting prices and wondering why the prices are so identical. He started to push an envelope towards, towards me on the table. And I started to stand up and I said, are you offering us money? And he said, well, you know, this and maybe you could pick, pick an urn on the wall and blah, blah, blah. And I turned to my sister and I said, Carrie, we're leaving now. My sister opened the envelope and it was $300. Can you imagine how insulted you would feel if a check was pushed across the room for you, basically telling you that your mother's death and your mother was worth $300? I have not, after three and a half years, been able to grieve over my mother. I've been trapped trying to get the word out about what is going on here. These are not numbers, they are statistics, these are people. SCI declined to be interviewed and said they don't comment on pending litigation. We had uh, found out a, a song that my mom used to sing to the troops that's called I'll Be Seeing You. Why don't I play it? Oh, do you, do you, well, no, play whatever you're, right you played here. your mom. Oh, you do? Really? Really? Yeah. Wow. And you know, I think the thing, Blake, is that a lot of this gets lost in the narrative of death because the fact is, is that it is a sacred right for all of us and that if there were more private providers that would be concerned about how they were providing that service, they would be more attuned to the needs of of the community. In all familiar places. Do you know that poem that William Carlos Williams wrote about the red wheelbarrow? I think it's only 14 words. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. What are you talking about, says I. I mean, I really tried to get that one. It was a December because we had two kids in our town that they lived by the river and they had ice over and they'd gone out and they fell through the ice and drowned. One was six, one was four, I think. We put them both in one casket. And I remember the minute walking those parents in to see these two little boys, they were in their Oshkosh, begosh, blue jeans. One had his arm on the other one. They look like two boyos. I remember looking out the window at my garage across the street and saying, I wish there was a wheelbarrow there. Something to take your, your gaze away on which you could concentrate all your attention so as to avert your eyes from this horrible notion that this could happen. To be a good funeral director, you have to notice right away that there are things that won't be fixed, but you can be present for them. Obviously, the, the, the tragic situations that you deal with, the car accidents, the suicides, I've had to deal with homicides, I've had, you know, many deaths of children, those are probably the hardest. Like my father, Doug Gilchrist ran his own funeral home for many years. He and my father studied together to become funeral directors. Death is always there, it's always in your face, it's always part of your everyday. Ah. Do you more? I suffered a very bad mental breakdown and I uh, was hospitalized for a couple of days and uh, of course as most funeral directors a couple of days later I'm back at the funeral. Over the period of the next four years I had another three nervous breakdowns. At one point of which I was told that I had PTSD. We grieve for those not only in our own family, we grieve for those families that we serve every day because we probably knew them. We probably buried their aunt or their uncle a year before. 
we know that there are funeral directors in Ontario who have been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder directly linked to their work. There appears to be a higher than average rate of alcoholism, um, certainly a, a higher than average rate of divorce. Michelle Clark works in funeral education. She and her husband, Paul, are both former funeral directors. We have lived in constant fear that these things were going to happen to our children or to us. Most funeral directors just suppress everything. We've, we've, we're taught how to do it. The most recent one was the lady that um, stabbed her son, son to death from postpartum. And like, and Ross was the exact same age as her son. I just like it was so real. So how, so how would that manifest itself? You would, you know, you'd be withdrawn and just and withdrawn. Quiet. Oh yeah, like I would just come home and just sort of just quiet, not say anything. Really, the little boy at the memorial gardens that the tree fell on. Like that was horrible. You don't even remember it. Oh my goodness, this is the thing. There's been so many pe stories for him. They were on a school field trip. The wind picked up and blew a tree branch on the kid. Remember, he was eight. No, I don't remember that oh. at all. For us, we're lucky because we're both funeral directors, so we get it. People just say that you, you're born to be a funeral director. And most people in our industry would say the same thing. That was why I went to this profession. And we know funeral directors that have born into that world and have continued a legacy on, and it's not what they wanted to do. And in part because of the guilt that you feel. They don't want to let their community down. And so they've given up their lives to do something they don't want to do. I found it. Oh, OK. We were close. It's been great for us. We would never have met or fallen in love if we weren't both funeral directors. But as parents, I, I wouldn't want it for our children. Actually, that's pretty good, eh? Yeah, no, you can see it well. You remember, obviously, the day we, we uh, buried Grandpa. I said, you know, I'm just going to stay and and just be with the cemetery staff when they lower down his casket into the vault. Just, it was just something I wanted to do as a son. Yeah. And then you walked over and uh, uh, you obviously sensed that I needed, uh, I needed comfort. I didn't want to leave either. Yeah, there. yeah. Yeah. You know, you never get over it, it's, but you, you learn to cope and, you know. I don't know what will eventually happen with my family's funeral home, and I don't think I will ever fully get over the guilt that I feel for not continuing their legacy. I understand now that I made the only choice I could. It's a sacred and solemn duty, but you'll never last if your heart's not in it. <laughs>